Well, welcome. My name is Adam Rubenfire, and I'm a content strategist at Modern Healthcare. I'll be moderating this webinar, optimizing your COVID-19 vaccine outreach. In this webinar, experts in patient communications and experience will offer advice and best practices on how leaders can ensure that their vaccination outreach efforts are efficient and reach key patient populations. And before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Reputation and Well Health. Reputation, creator of the Reputation Experience Management category, is changing the way healthcare organizations gather and act on patient feedback to drive decision making and enhance consumer experience programs. Well Health is a software as a service digital health leader in patient communications and the 2021 best in class winner in patient outreach. Well Health's Intelligent Communications Hub is the only two-way digital health solution engaging patients throughout their entire care experience. Now I'm thrilled to introduce our pot panelists for today's session. You can see them on webcam. Uh, Meg Aronow is the Senior Vice President of Client Success and Platform Evan Evangelist at Well. Before joining Well, she served as CIO for the Boston Medical Center and Senior Research Director with Advisory Boards Information Technology Strategy Council. Annie Harmon is Head of Strategy and Consulting for Healthcare and Life Sciences at Reputation. In her role, uh, she partners with large complex healthcare organizations to provide strategic consulting and data-driven insights to maximize value and drive patient acquisition. A couple housekeeping notes before we get started. We want this webinar to be an interactive experience for you, our audience. You're encouraged to ask questions using the questions pane in your GoToWebinar attendee panel. The speakers will try to address as many of your questions as they have time for. And you can also download content from our sponsors in the handouts folder of your attendee panel. We've got a couple different pieces uh, on COVID-19 vaccine outreach that um, should be really helpful. And should you need any assistance during the webinar, please don't hesitate to contact us via the questions pane in your attendee panel. Uh, myself and my colleague, Sally Zimmerman, are here to help you. Uh, and now we'll begin with brief presentations from our presenters. Uh, on their best practices for vaccine outreach. Meg, I'm thrilled to start with you. Hey, thanks so much, Adam. And hey, everybody, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, Adam did a great job interview, uh, introducing uh, Well Health. We consider ourselves the last mile of patient communication, unifying what has been disparate messaging from provider organizations into a single conversational thread for patients. Uh, when COVID hit, uh, we took it as our mission to serve our, both the, our current customers and those folks that were in our uh, pipeline and talking to us already. And we did so at you know drastically reduced uh, cost. We really wanted to be a part of the citizen solution uh, for what was happening. And one of the things that we continued to do was to march with our uh, provider partners uh, as the situation changed and evolved and as their needs and their patients' needs changed. And so when the vaccines hit, uh, one of the things we did was to design a fully conversational interactive pathway with patients to try to maximize the throughput and the efficiency of provider operations uh, at the same time reaching as many of their patients as possible. And so I've just got a few slides here that'll walk you through uh, what that conversational uh, engagement looks like uh, based on best practices that we were able to develop in partnership with our customers. Uh, so it's a, it's a, I forget how many slides we have here, a couple of slides, but I think we'll show you sort of the top uh, six or eight workflows uh, that we've strung together uh, in order to maximize the efficiency. So we start, of course, uh, with reassuring patients. And although we're well into the vaccine rollout now, uh, we see that uh, it's still a necessary thing to reassure patients, to talk about safety, to talk about the why and the how of getting the vaccine. And so our conversation starts there. Uh, which is where most provider conversations would start. Uh, we move into education, patient, educating patients about availability and dosing. Uh, if they're hesitant, we reach out further with additional educational resources. Uh, most of this is happening without the need for human intervention. We use AI to power these conversations, although we can always exit the conversation into a nurse call center or other resources available at the provider organization. You can go on to the next slide, Adam. So uh, following that, uh, once folks have indicated that they're interested in the vaccine, uh, we go into what is our normal cadence of appointment uh, confirmations and reminders. 
Uh, we maybe add a few extra reminders. That's completely up to our provider partners, but just to make sure that patients understand uh, where they're going, uh, how to arrive, what to bring with them, et cetera. All of that can be embedded in these conversations. Uh, and then after each dose is administered, the first or the second, uh, if you're getting two vaccines or administering two vaccines, uh, we do have a conversational bot that, that reaches out uh, to check for reactions. Um, to provide reassurance if those reactions are those that would be typical, such as soreness in the arm, uh, but also to provide one of those off-ramps that I discussed uh, to a nurse call center or to a provider if a patient indicates that the symptoms are maybe some of the more severe system, uh, symptoms uh, that might require some intervention or at least some reassurance directly from a provider. You can go on to the next slide, Adam. Second dose, um, we have considered, and I think it's well documented at this point, that uh, to schedule the second dose, it's best to do it at the first dose while the patient is right there with you. Uh, if, you if that's not possible, we do have uh, part of our conversation that can reach out uh, quickly, really as soon as, as the patient leaves the facility or any time thereafter to get that second dose scheduled. Uh, we have not seen from our patients um, the significant drop-off and when I say our patients, of course, I mean our provider partner patients. Uh, we haven't seen um, a significant drop off in terms of second dose, but we, we're always um, aligned to the expectations that the providers want to ensure that they're guarding against that. Uh, for those times when there is a no-show um, or even if there is a refusal, we do have automated conversations that engage more deeply with the patients to understand why they missed the appointment or why they may be hesitant about the appointment. Um, so that we can provide additional educational material, perhaps have personal touch with a, um, with a care provider actually reaching out. But um, everything that we can do, again, sort of minimum burden um, on the healthcare staff, but to try to engage those patients to make sure that they come back in. And then I think we've got one more slide, Adam. Uh, part of the other thing that we do is that we assist in any way we can. We cannot fully satisfy the information reporting um, requirements that our provider organizations have, but we can participate uh, by contributing the data that we do have for those things that were um, achieved via our system. Of course, providers have other systems at play, EMRs, other types of information, some uh, inventory systems for their dosing, et cetera. Uh, but we are a participant in that and do what we can to ease the burden in terms of uh, reporting. And then more lately, uh, we have been talking with our partners about the need to create a waiting list uh, for extra dosing vaccines. So that, of course, wasn't an, an issue uh, in the beginning, uh, but as we've progressed uh, along the trajectory, uh, it has become more of an issue. And uh, so many of our provider partners are now working to make sure that when slots do open up because of no-shows or for some reason there's extra vaccine, that they have a list that they can contact and reach out to uh, to make, uh, make use of those doses as efficiently as possible. So as things continue to change, uh, we will continue to evolve with our partners, but uh, that's our standard workflow. Thanks, Excellent. Adam. Well, thank you so much, Meg. Uh, appreciate that presentation. And I, I want to go to Annie next, but uh, audience, as our presenters get through these presentations, um, if you have any questions about what they're saying, please do send them to us. Um, and, and right after Annie, we're going to get into some panel Q&A, and we'll take your questions, uh, along with some questions I have for our panelists. So Annie, I'll uh, go ahead and give you the floor. Thank you, Adam. And uh, just a little introduction about who we are here at Reputation. We established the online reputation management category back in 2006, and we've been helping healthcare brands to improve their online reputation and consumer experience ever since. We partner with some of the leading technology uh, companies, as well as uh, being invested in by some of the most important healthcare investment partners that uh, are out there today, such as Ascension Ventures, Heritage Partners, and some others. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Adam, I wanna level set where we are in terms of an industry and help to sort of frame the conversation for how uh, we are analyzing consumer sentiment around the coronavirus vaccine. And that might help to educate some of the ways that you are out there uh, bringing in patients and, uh, and getting that community fully vaccinated. So 
we know that healthcare has changed and it's really being driven by consumerism. And our recent consumer healthcare study that we did through a third party found that the vast majority of healthcare consumers uh, trust online ratings and reviews. And in fact, it was the number three uh, factor when it came to making a decision about their care, it, right behind location and insurance provided. So it is absolutely an important uh, factor when people are looking at where they might need to go to get vaccinated or to reassure them that vaccination is, is the right choice for them. We know also that Google is the number one review site used by healthcare consumers. That is uh, by far. And not only is that what consumers indicated to us, but it's also what the data would, would indicate. There is a vastly larger amount of healthcare reviews happening on Google than there are on any other platform. So this is the framework and the lens through which we are looking at how you should be communicating about coronavirus and the vaccination. So Google owns this entire consumer journey. And, and I'm sorry to say it, but all of the investment in our websites is not going to do any good until we actually own that Google experience as well, because Google is going to intercept that traffic. So they're going to do a near me search. They're going to see these results. And increasingly, they're able to take all of the action that they need to from right there in the Google panel. During the initial stages of the pandemic, as uh, healthcare had to shift to a virtual care option, they added that as an attribute from right there in the knowledge panel. And so consumers could start having a visit right there. Now they are looking at adding tags for coronavirus uh, vaccinations. What's available at this location? Who are they vaccinating? Who is eligible? And, um, and this is, an alignment, is in alignment with Google search trends today as well. And if you go to the next slide here, Adam, I want to start by looking at the search trends related to vaccines in the U.S. So as you can see, the consumer searches related to vaccines saw a dramatic increase around December and into January. And then they saw an increase again in March. These searches continued to remain very high until around April. And so for the last four weeks, what we've seen is that there has been a steady decline in the searches around vaccines since then. Now, it's only been a few weeks, so it's too soon to extrapolate the cause for that decline, but there are a number of possibilities here, including an increase in the availability of the vaccine through primary care providers. Um, as Meg mentioned, they are communicating directly to patients. There are, there are some best practices here that are starting to be adopted more, and so it's possible that consumers are getting the right information from their primary care providers and their uh, healthcare brands that they are already connected to, and they are having to do less of the research on their own. But again, this is just an observation and this is what we're seeing in the data. Uh, if you go to the next slide here, this was some interesting information that I found uh, using Google search trends data, and this is for this past week. So this is really timely, May 3rd through the 9th. And um, these are the top five questions that consumers are asking on Google uh, related to coronavirus. There are plenty of other questions they're asking, but these are the top five related to um, the coronavirus vaccine. And this tells us more about what consumers are confused about and what kind of information they're trying to get. And as you can see, some of them are still questioning the most basic facts around the vaccine. The number one uh, question is, is the COVID vaccine FDA approved? We would hope that they know this already, but because of all of the misinformation that is swirling here, it's something that consumers are still asking. And if you'll notice, two of the five questions are about which vaccine is better or best. And this is a consumer behavior that really illustrates where we are as an industry. Uh, we are now in a feedback driven industry and people aren't simply going to the one that uh, is, is nearest by or the one that they were told to go to or the one that they were referred to. They actually wanna choose which vaccine they wanna get. I mean, imagine you know, years past if a consumer had been 
shopping for what flu vaccine they should get. No one did. We, we didn't even care about the brands. But because there's been so much education around this, consumers want to choose. They want to choose which vaccine they get. And, uh, and that is really evident in the searches that are happening online. So now let's talk about what kind of feedback we are seeing after the fact. So after the consumer has had that interaction, some sort of clinical action interaction, whether it's getting vaccinated, getting tested, whatever, we are seeing that the review trends are trending higher. So consumers are having better experiences. And this chart shows quarter by quarter over the past year, consumer sentiment is improving. So we started out, it was less than three stars. It was a 2.9 out of five stars for, for the average of the experiences that people were having that mentioned COVID-19 or related terms. And this makes sense because, you know, over the past year we had some challenges. At first it was, we didn't have enough testing or the protocols weren't communicated effectively or you know, consumers just weren't ready for it. And now we see that that has moved up to a 3.5. And that tells us that the experiences are not only improving, but also the expectations for consumers, I think, are more in line with what they should be expecting. You know, they expect to be waiting uh, in a, a socially distanced waiting room. They expect to be asked to wear a mask or to have their temperature taken. So we've done a good job of starting to get used to this new normal. And that expectation is now aligning with the reality and making it more likely that it is a, an expected and positive experience. This next slide is specific to the vaccine. So, you know, this is newer data. Vaccines have been um, around for just the last few months here. But what we are seeing is that compared to um, the previous quarter, the Q1 data tells us that there are 16 times more mentions of the vaccine in their experiences than the previous quarter. So uh, this is definitely a critical part of the consumer experience, the vaccination experience. And we're seeing that it is generally a positive experience. So um, 4.5 out of five stars for any type of healthcare experience is very good. And when it comes to vaccines, what we're seeing is that uh, that is, you know, it's much higher than um, than what their general experience might be for any healthcare uh, interaction that they're having. So it is uh, very positive to see these findings and that people are having a good experience. So finally, I just want to leave you with a few best practices uh, based on the data that we have been tracking. First and foremost, you have to optimize your local search. As I showed before, consumers are turning to Google. It's the number one place for them to learn about what other people's experience has been. So you've got to claim and actively manage your online listings. The second piece is answer questions. As Meg mentioned, there is uh, there are lots of questions being asked. You wanna make sure that you can inform and provide a consistent story, even if it's an automated story. You, know, you can work through Google Messages to provide um, a, a workflow that answers questions around coronavirus. And then if it gets to a point where they need to be transferred to a nurse, you know, that's, that's something that is uh, entirely possible. The other thing you need to do is ask for feedback from all experiences. One of the things that we noticed early on is that as healthcare systems ramped up their virtual care, they uh, had feedback coming in through a different channel. Maybe it was living in the uh, platform for that virtual care experience, or maybe it was being collected separately, but it wasn't being collected into a single place like the in-person visits were. And as virtual becomes the, you know, the, the new normal, as we've all gotten used to calling it, even if it's reduced in the number of visits, it's still going to be something that we are doing for the long haul. And we want to collect all of that feedback. The other reason to be asking for feedback for these virtual experiences is that those ratings and reviews are going to improve your SEO online. It's going to improve your uh, Google My Business pro uh, ranking and prominence. And unless you ask for those reviews with virtual experiences, you're not going to have as much volume as you did previously when every experience was in person. 
Uh, combat misinformation, we know that this has been a huge challenge and uh, our recommendation is to get out in front of it before it becomes an issue. And one way that you can do that is to monitor your online chatter, monitor social to see what the trends are, uh, look at Google Trends, see what consumers in your region or your community are searching for. You can tell where things where things are in terms of information, what people are still confused about, and then you can use that information in your future marketing and get ahead of it with proactive storytelling and testimonials on your social channels. So uh, those are some ways that you could take action now, and uh, and you know, I'll turn it back over to Adam for for some more conversation here. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Annie. Thanks to both of you, uh, audience. You could see we've got. Two, uh, you know, folks who are talking about outreach here, but but um, from unique perspectives, you know, reputation reviews, um, as well as communication, and, and, and really how to um, engage patients. Um, uh, you know, so we're we're really excited to get into Q and A. Um, I've got some questions here, and we've already we've got plenty of questions coming in from the audience. Audience, continue to send in questions. We'll take them for as long as we can, and and um, our sponsors are going to get these questions after the fact, so um, they want to know. What you um, what, what what challenges you have and what questions you have. So please feel free to send those. Um, but I want to start big picture and kind of a, a where are we now uh, question. So according to the latest data from the CDC, just pulled it. Um, it over 34.8 percent of Americans are fully vaccinated, and about 46 percent have received at least one dose. Uh, I, I'd love to hear, uh, starting with Meg, um, you know, what your thoughts are and how far we've come how we got here and what lies ahead. You know, I mean, just over a year ago, um, you know, we, we we had no vaccine, you know, no, uh, and the virus was new. So uh, Meg, where are we now? Uh, thanks, Adam. Well, that, that's an easy question. I'll get back to you in the next few hours on that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, big picture, I'd say, um, it's easy to point out the mistakes, right? And uh, I, I'm a, a television addict in terms of online news 24 seven. And so I hear it constantly in a loop. Um, but I'll also say it's kind of amazing what has been accomplished. You know, we really started from a pretty depleted place. Uh, you've probably heard we were sort of pulling back on what we were doing with the World Health Organization. I think, you know, and I'm coming at this from a public health point of view, it's my background, but, and, you know, I think in the U.S. we've dismantled some things or really sort of just let some things atrophy over the years. So we really weren't even starting from a level playing field. And so I think we did a lot, a lot, a lot to catch up. Um, I think what is happening now, though, is, of course, is that our messaging has to get more personal and more, more uh, specialized. So we started with big mass messaging campaigns that frankly created a lot of confusion. They, they did a lot of good also, but there was sort of this collateral damage of confusion, right? And then the providers got more engaged and started, you know, making more specific messaging. And and now we're almost down to, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, as they would say, right? We've got to, you know, we've gotten all the people that were eager, and now we've got to turn our attention to the, to the folks that aren't. Um, I think we're on the right track uh, to sort of answer the big picture question. I think this will come to a positive conclusion. Uh, and I will just put in one plug to say uh, this is a clarion call for us to really, and as as a country, uh, upgrade our public health system, how we think about processes, how we think about communication, and how we think about tracking. Because unfortunately, uh, this is just the state of the world we live in today, and there will be other needs uh, to use a public health in infrastructure. So I think lessons learned will be very important. Excellent. Annie, your thoughts? I mean, Meg said it so perfectly. I, I agree with everything she said about just the, the idea that this is this is waking up uh, many to issues that have existed in healthcare for too long, uh, but most people just didn't realize it or, or saw only a, a small part of it. And for consumers, you know, they didn't know why things were uh, so so messed up or so full of friction. They just felt the friction. They felt that pain. And uh, I think that where we are as an industry is that there's been this uh, mass wake up to the need to rely on technology 
and share data uh, because there's there's no way we come out of this crisis without sharing data across platforms, sharing um, data with consumers, you know, educating the public. And, um, you know, beyond that, it, it, the conversation around, you know, some of the, the privacy concerns and, and HIPAA and all that, I think has shifted to rather than using HIPAA as a as a barrier or to block our ability to communicate about these things, we're going to um, uh, use use our ability, our technology to communicate to the patients where and when they need it, make sure they get the care they need, and that that is so important that if we run up against some of the you know regulation of the past, Let's do that. Let's run up against it. And then let's figure out how to adjust the regulations to meet the needs of consumers today, because we can't keep operating the way we have in the past. And, and you know, consumers won't, won't let us. They're going to, to expect us to, uh, to respond differently from now on. Well, and, and Annie, that's a good segue into our next question. So I'll stay with you for this. I mean, we're moving from appointment only to walk in for in a lot of cities. Um, even here in, you know, I'm in Chicago and it's we're a large city with a lot of demand, but we're still moving into walk-in. So how does that change the dynamics of how we reach out to patients? Do we have to work harder to get people in the door? I know Meg, you, you know, you talked a little bit about kind of how we 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 can't the mass messaging is is not is no longer the way to do that. So so Annie, you know, what are some of the barriers to getting people vaccinated in this new phase and, and how do we overcome those? I mean, there's there are so many barriers, um, you know, not just the, you know, in the beginning, it was all about the edu educating, educating the public, educating the public. The public has the information now. Um, and now it's about breaking down the barriers to that access. And from our perspective, we look at what is the the first barrier that they may face. If I'm a consumer and I'm looking online and uh, I see information for a clinic near me, I, you know, I've got to have the right information, especially you know, if there's a, you've got a rural patient or a rural situation where they might take hours just organizing the transportation to get to that facility. Then they show up and uh, the hours have changed or they've had to close for the day because there was some sort of a, 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 a running out of the, the vaccine or there was an outbreak of the virus or maybe they're a, a, a no COVID location. You know, whatever that is, you've got to make sure that your uh, first line of information to consumers is completely up to date, that you have a way to update that at scale to manage those, those online listings and to get out in front of uh, consumers before they have those issues of, you know, how do I, how do I spend another day getting out here when I got the wrong information in, initially and, and now I can't get my vaccine. You've got to have all of your services updated, all of the access points, you know, must be up to date and you've got to be doing that uh, in real time. The other piece of it is you've got to be able to answer questions from consumers from right there within Google. Google has given us the tools to do this. We've got Q&A, we've got Google messaging, you know, consumers want this. They, they, are, they are using these tools. And if we are not out there, then we are just uh, leaving a, a huge gap when it comes to that experience. And we're making it harder for consumers to, to actually show up for us. Meg, do you have anything to add on, on how kind of the customization of messaging changes now that we are, we need to be a little bit more um, uh, proactive and not reactive? Well, you know, I think, uh, I think Annie's points were awesome. I think, you know, it right now, so much attention goes to the quote unquote anti-vaxxers, mm -hmm. but there's this whole other bolus of folks, right, that it's not a, that they're against it. There are issues of access. Right. And so I think everything that she said was right on. And if they are a little hesitant, I hate to use that word because it's kind of overused. But, you know, I think we're past the point of talking at people and telling them why they should. And I think we need to start engaging in conversation about why. So instead of telling them, let's ask them, what's holding you back? What's preventing you? Some of those will be issues of access. And in that case, in addition to the things that Annie said, you know, employers could step up. They can they can create, you know, workplace vaccine clinics. They can help people with transportation. 
other communities can help up and step up in terms of child care. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why it's difficult for folks who could be interested um, to, to actually get to a place where they could act, receive the vaccine. So I'm all for the, for the walk-ins. I think that removes one layer of barrier right there. And then we've got more work to do after that. And I think, uh, as you mentioned, I've talked about before, these personalized messages engaging what exactly is your barrier as opposed to the messages writ large coming from the government. So, but Meg, you mentioned that kind of it's turning from, you know, not um, not going after anti-vaxxers, but kind of getting into the why you should get it. Do, do Is there still a need in, to combat misinformation about the vaccines and the virus? And do you have any thoughts on how to do that in that setting? Yeah, I mean, there will always be that need. We can't, I guess, you know, I didn't mean to say, like, take all your attention from one and put it on the other. Got it's it. kind of a both-end strategy, right? And I just don't want to lose track of those people that would be willing. Um, and again, education is not just about people who are against the science of it. There's other public policies around that, right? There are people that um, are hesitant to get vaccines because they think they'll have to show citizenship. And, and if they can't, that something bad will happen or they think they have to pay. Um, you know, so there, there's a lot of education that we can do that's policy, not science. Uh, but of course, we have to we do have to keep up with the science. I'm not sure. I think that that, you know, that's sort of a dwindling return, unfortunately, in terms of, you know, continuing to push on the science button. But we can't stop. And I think we see these startling images right from 1918 from 100 years ago, where it was the same thing within the context of, of their era, right, where there were folks that were refusing then too, and that is still a right in this country is to refuse. Thank you, that's that's a great point. A Annie, I, I'm, I'm curious um, your thoughts, because I know the social media companies and, and Google um, and, 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 you know, and, and other um, tech giants have really, um, I spend a lot of time on this issue, so I'm curious if you have any thoughts on on how um, our our readers should should combat misinformation. Yeah, I I I think Meg said it really well when she said we've given too much attention to the anti-vaxxers, and and we've got to we've got to change the narrative. Um, we can't be reactive to um, the the misinformation that's out there. We've got to be proactive with the the storytelling that we are putting out there about getting vaccinated. And one of the things that hasn't changed since the uh, since before the pandemic and now is that consumers trust physicians. They trust nurses. And um, in some cases, we're seeing that that trust is has even increased since the since the um, pandemic began. And we can use that, you know, use your physicians and your nurses as ambassadors of this, uh, you know, this this uh, move to uh, get the entire community vaccinated. These the storytelling element of this cannot be um, uh, overstated here. I mean, it, you're combating uh, facts with, you know, this this idea that there is um, a, a different a different fact out there. And as we've seen, you know, perception becomes reality very quickly. So in in this case, I think the perception uh, can can also uh, be used to help drive a a uh, a comfort level and a trust in getting that vaccine by using people who they do trust you know get those stories out there show show uh, um you know we saw we saw those amazing news stories of you know, the nurse who was the first to get the vaccine in the US and that was so emotional and and now you know i'm seeing a lot of healthcare organizations are are showing photos of of their physicians their nurses and and why they got vaccinated you know it's it's not that i was told to it's because you know now I can go to my kids' soccer game and stand in a crowd, and I couldn't do that before. You know, let's let's talk about the things that we can do, and um, and why we should get vaccinated instead of trying to react to the misinformation and the negativity that that is out there. Because we'll waste all of our time doing that, and uh, we won't be able to get to uh, the the success on the other side of this. Yeah, it may be best to take a cue from the CDC. That's the CDC's 
communications have been doing that as well. I thought they had a really mm -hmm. great graphic of, you know, people with masks under the things that you could do. Uh, Meg, I I'm getting a, a, a few different questions for you and I'm gonna kind of bring them together. Um, we know that we need to avoid waste of vaccines. Um, so I'm wondering what best practices you can share for providers who are hoping to minimize no-shows and cancellations. Um, how to respond if somebody ignores reminders or refuses to get their second dose. Uh, I'm also being asked how you've been tracking drop the drop-off rate uh, after the second dose. So I'm happy to repeat, that was a, a few different questions in one, but generally you're trying to get an idea of, of how to respond to, to no-shows, you know, whether it's first or second dose, and, and, and how to track and respond to the, to the second dose drop-off. Sure, I'm happy to take that on. And of course, my learning in this regard comes directly um, from our customers and from their experience um, using our application or, or using other applications if they have them surrounding our application. But um, generally, I think um, it's, it's uh, the flow that I mentioned. So it's starting with education to kind of um, um, engage patients with, you know, feeling how important this is, right, to begin with. Uh, but then it is it is pretty much the standard reminders. Now our customers use well, so they're texting patients for the most part with um, reminders. And they even before COVID, they had a cadence that they were using on um, that they would each customize to their own organization. But it was usually something like I'm going to send a reminder seven days in advance, then I'm going to send one three days in advance, and then maybe I'll send one the day before. Um, so some of our customers during the um, COVID. Uh, scenarios have doubled down on that. So maybe they send an, an extra reminder. Um, so it's pretty easy with text. It's pretty non-invasive. It's a great way to reach people kind of where they are. So text has been particularly, I think, effective um, during this time. So I think that those reminders, it's a doubling down on just a, sort of what the standard reminders are. And then it's a very quick follow-up when there's a miss, right? A very quick follow-up say, you know, geez, we're sorry you didn't come in in the past hour because that's when you were scheduled. Would you like to come in later today, right? It's trying to, to shorten that turnaround time in terms of bringing folks back in and then doing everything that they can to make it easy for folks that miss either the first or second to reschedule. So a lot of our customers uh, newly uh, implemented self-scheduling during this time. Right, to try, again, you know, it's all about barriers that we talked about before, right, to try to reduce the barriers. So if, if schedule, you know, self-scheduling works, um, a lot of folks have been, have been implementing that just as another barrier to remove. So I think there's sort of no magic there other than to say um, it's a doubling down and trying to, to get patients to show and make it as easy as possible if they miss an appointment to rebook an appointment. Um, in terms of unused vaccines, I haven't gotten a lot of feedback from our customers about that. Um, some, I know many did start these waiting lists for people that felt that they could come in on short notice. So if there were extra doses um, that they would be able to be used. I think other than that, I've got um, sort of uh, anecdotal information from our customers that they are, you know, have gotten very smart about storage and how to, and how to hold these things to maximize the ability for throughput. Um, making sure that they don't take out too many of the doses that need to stay refrigerated, et cetera. So um, they're doing a lot of inventory management things separate from our system, but uh, I think they've had some learnings from, from the early days on that. But the waiting list seems to have been uh, very effective and um, perhaps it'll be a little less necessary now that there's walk-in ability at, at more locations, but uh, it certainly is one effective tool. Excellent. You know, Annie, I, I think it just shows where we are today um, and how far we've come that people are leaving reviews about vaccinations, right, uh, for, for COVID-19. I mean, I think, uh, you know, until recently, people were thankful to, to run and get it wherever they could. Um, I, I'm curious what, what you know, content wise, what kind of feedback we're seeing about experiences. And, and, and when providers get positive or negative feedback, how should they respond? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we are seeing that um, that people are commenting, uh, the trend is that they are commenting positively on these experiences. And I think that's, that's largely because we've gotten a lot better with the logistics. I mean, the experience is, is getting better. You're not 
you're not standing in a long line, you're, you know, the even, even the waiting room uh, experience for any type of visit has gotten better. I mean, I mean, I would, I love sitting in my car and just, you know, looking at my phone until it's time for me to go in. And, um, and, and so I think that those experiences are going to continue to improve. And what this means for providers is that if you are not requesting reviews today, there has never been a better time to start doing so. Um, you know, one of the things that I hear all the time from from healthcare organizations is that the, the sentiment that they see or the star rating that they see on Google is not reflective of the actual experience that a patient is having. And, you know, you can point to CAPS and say, you know, on CAPS I've got a 4.8 stars and here on Google, I've got a three. And, and so I don't trust that. And, um, and the, the reason for that is because there's not a statistically significant uh, number of reviews in most cases that, you know, they're not getting a three star experience. It's that only the people who were mad uh, went out of their way to post a review. And when you only have, you know, 10 reviews, that those few people who are upset can really have an effect on, on the, you know, the math there. So ask everyone for feedback. Ask for a review from every single patient who has an, an experience with you. And, you know, whether that's getting vaccinated or an annual wellness visit, whatever the case is, make sure you're asking for reviews because that's the only way to get enough volume of feedback to really push down some of that negative sentiment that you might have today as an average. You know, we've seen, you know, 100% of the time, this, this is what happens. And it's, it's because of our human nature. If you ask me about my experience, I'm probably going to, to tell you that it was pretty good. But if you hadn't asked me, I'm not going to go out of my way to find you and tell you that. But if I had a bad experience, I might go out of my way to find you and tell you. And that's what we're seeing in healthcare too. And so think about that as, as what this future uh, consumerism state looks like is that we are publicly sharing feedback where the public is going. They're not going to be going to your CAP scores. They're going to be going to Google. And they want to see feedback from other real patients who are, are speaking about their own experiences and they trust that. They put, they put more value in that and trust in that than they do on your own marketing website because patients think that that is marketing. Whereas on Google, that's just information that is user generated. Other patients have provided that information. So it's a, a valid source and it's a source that we need to start paying attention to and asking for reviews on because that's the only way that we're going to um, make sure that uh, consumers see the reality of what that experience can be. Excellent. Thank you so much. You know, Meg, one of the points where we can see dissatisfaction or frustration is when customers um, can get a different answer from the call center versus the live chat versus marketing versus maybe what they heard from their doctor or even their friend. Um, you know, who talked to somebody at the call center or something. I'm just wondering, um, do you have any tips for kind of breaking down silos and, you know, ensuring that messaging is consistent across channels? Because there, you know, I know Well talks about this. There are so many different channels today where consumers can get information. Yeah, you're right. Uh, that's really that's really the mission. That's uh, our mission, and uh, what our CEO had in mind when he founded the company was um, this idea of unifying the communication, right? Because even, you don't have to look to COVID to see that we have we're getting mixed messages, a different message from the practice than maybe you got from the billing office, and you know maybe you got from the front desk or the information desk when you went in, or what was on the website, right? So we're kind of everybody well intended. Uh, trying to do the right thing. And so, you know, well is one of the tools that can be used to unify that messaging, right? It's very, you can customize it, but uh, within the customization, making sure that it's standard fr coming from all points within your organization is important. I think one of the things that we didn't know uh, when we when we started the company was that um, some of the folks in communication in, in the provider organizations, communications or marketing, whatever you want to call it, the folks that are interested in messaging um, would really sort of gravitate to this idea of unifying the messaging, right? Because they've been trying to herd cats 
And so now all of a sudden they had an easy to configure tool that would allow them to get out the messaging. And that, you know, I think one of the things we did learn that is very specific to COVID is that when we're in this era of evolving information and evolving tactics, we have to have tools, whether it's well or something else. So I don't want to make it a commercial, but we have to have tools that are really agile, right? There's no more this sort of set it and forget it. Oh, I've got one message about how you should arrive to the hospital, right? We no longer have that because now it depends on if you're infected, you're not infected, the day of the week, who's at the practice, where are you headed, where are you parking, right? It, so everything has to be very malleable and configurable. And that's, that's going to stay with us post-COVID. Right, we need to have unified messaging, and you know, Annie and 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 you also, Adam, both talked about trust, and it's very hard to build trust if you're inconsistent, right? Just kind of think about parenting, right? If you just, you just want to stay consistent and and stay on message um, all the time, and that's the way you become a dependable partner with your patients is is by being consistent. So it's super important. Uh, well is one way to do it. Uh, there's other ways to do it too, but it takes constant attention. Any anything to add to that? You know, I, I know you like Meg. You've worked in a health system um, environment before. Any thoughts on how you kind of bridge these different channels? Yeah, it, you know, it's it, it's really important to think about where your uh, consumer is going to be getting that information. And, you know, whether it's um, they're looking for it for their child or themselves or a parent, um, understand exactly what your consumer needs. And, you know, we, we've always done persona development and, and you know, who, what's my buyer persona and, and um, what does that consumer look like? And, and a lot of times in healthcare, you know, you've got this, um, the adult daughter who is, who is having to manage this for herself, her children, her parents. Uh, and, and if every time she goes to make an appointment, she's getting different information. And you've got one person who's trying to manage all of this and, um, and that can be a huge barrier to, to uh, getting all of this out there. And so think about, you know, as, as Meg mentioned, that, this story is changing. It, the The story changes every day. I mean, we, you, you know, you mentioned um, earlier today when we logged on about uh, uh, you know, the approval for for even younger children to get vaccinated, and and so you've got to have a plan for how you get this out there before the story changes, so that when the story changes or or we get more information to educate uh, our our approach to this stuff, that the people who need that information are getting it where they are, how they consume it, and at the right time. It's the, you know, it's the old Google uh, uh, tagline of right, right content, right person, right time. This is all about getting the uh, most up-to-date information to the right person in the channels that they need it. And whether it's through a Google search or um, a text from their primary care provider or through an online chat, that has to be, uh, always, always the right information and the most up-to-date information. And, um, you know, it's, it's difficult, but uh, lean into technology and, and automation. It's not, it's not that scary. It's, it's actually what consumers want. They, they want it to be easier. So, um, so I think, I think that uh, we're more accepting of that now than maybe we were in the past, but we've got to always uh, think about that person receiving the message and exactly what it is that they are going to need at that time. Well, and, and on that note, you know, we got a, we just got a very good question from the audience that I'm sure a lot of leaders can sympathize with, which is, um, you know, this executive told us they live in a polarized, uh, politically polarized rural area um, where some of the pushback, you know, can be politically based, ideologically based. Um, do you respond to that, Annie, or do you, do you, do you kind of leave it? Um, do you have any thoughts? On that? I'm sure it somewhat depends on the content, but I'm just curious, how, how do you handle that? It's very tricky. Uh, one of the things that we see a lot is that healthcare systems are uh, challenged with what is it that their physicians and nurses are saying? You know, do they have someone out there commenting on, on comment boards that can then be tracked back to the healthcare brand? And we've seen this a few times where there is a, a political statement or something highly divisive or something that is about the the uh, 
vaccine that is uh, not the same story that uh, that the brand is is wanting to be speaking from. And in those cases, it's really important for healthcare systems to have a, um, a proactive plan to respond to this because it's going to come up. It's always going to come up. I have not uh, met a single person who has worked in the provider space who hasn't faced some sort of a, um, a, a social media issue even before coronavirus. Um, and so, you know, not only do you need those policies in place for what is, what are we allowed to say as a representative of the brand while also respecting freedom of speech, but you also have to have a plan for what is your healthcare brand's uh, position on this because what will happen is a consumer says, well, I saw, you know, Dr. So-and-so said this and, uh, and you know, who should I, who should I believe here? You have to have um, a, a way to say, look, we, you know, respect the, you know, freedom of speech out there, but this is why this is what we think is the right thing to do. This is why we want you to get vaccinated. Uh, here are some resources to schedule that appointment. We would we would like for you to get vaccinated, and don't go down the road of going back and forth. You simply need to prepare what you are going to say and be ready to say that when you run up against this, um, you know, some of that political friction. Um, if you start to get into a uh, well back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, that's when you know you 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 end up with these viral social media issues where you know the brand the brand didn't didn't do anything wrong, but they engaged with someone who clearly wasn't out to actually get an answer to a question. They were out to trigger a response and and instigate something. So. Um, be aware that there's a lot of that out there, and it sounds like you're already facing some of that with the political landscape that we are in, and uh, and know when to not engage. It's just as important to know when to just you know, make your statement and and call it a day and not keep going down the path, because it, it'll go the same way as Meg was talking about, you know, don't spend all your time on the anti-vaxxers, don't spend all your time reacting to uh, the conversation that, that uh, outsiders might be having, really focus on those that need the help, answer the questions that are genuine, and, um, and consider the rest to be just kind of noise that is the, you know, the percentage that you can't get sucked down the rabbit hole on. And that's what we advise all of our clients who are doing this. And, and you know, they've got multiple social media channels, multiple review channels, and uh, it can be overwhelming. So it's it's good to have the um, you know, that that position ahead of time before you get into the situation. Well, and every channel has a different tone when it comes to this kind of thing. Uh, we don't we see it on every channel, but the way it's expressed, totally different. Yeah, Meg. I, Thank you, Annie. Meg, do you do you have any thoughts on this, especially when we're talking about clinicians talking to patients over, you know, apps? I, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how to best handle this. I, I, you know, I think uh, it's it's all embedded in parts of the answers that we've had to other questions, right? It's about the consistency. It's about sticking to message. Um, I agree with with Annie. It's you know, stick to what you know, what you want to say, what your own message is. Um, and just keep fighting. I think it's very hard, uh, you know, swimming upstream to fight against family and friends, which is also, also often embedded, embedded with the politics. It's hard, but you want to make sure your message is out there so there is an alternative uh, set of facts, as someone used to say, right? But you want, you want to make sure that your message is out there for the folks that want to turn to your message. And I will say that, um, you know, what we've gone through in the changes of communication channels from providers during COVID has really been profound in terms of people feeling more connected to their provider and their provider organization. And, and also moving it to texting, as we've done, there's just something a bit more intimate and connected about that. It's the same way I talk with my family. I'm also you know, talking with my provider organization. And so I think that that is a mechanism to get those messages to really resonate. But I would say, try all those channels, right? Try the web, try texting, try email, try portal. Try Facebook, you know, try try whatever, uh, and but just be consistent across all of those channels. Excellent. Um, and, and Meg, on that note, do you have any advice for for rural organizations, you know, where they may 
where patients are going to have to travel a bit more? Is there any different way that you communicate when you're in that situation and dealing with patients who may be remote? You know, it's always been a challenge, right? So COVID, in that sense, COVID is not new. Uh, rural medicine has always been about folks, uh, heroes, really, willing to communicate, willing to travel, willing, willing to bring the vaccine to various uh, outposts, right? There's been some great stories, particularly in the wilderness uh, areas of Alaska, of nurses that have just are really just true heroes in terms of driving thousands of miles to try to get to sort of centrally located small church to serve, you know, a community of 20 or whatever. Um, I don't know of a better way than to continue to distribute it that way. There's some exciting science, you know, so maybe next time uh, will be great. There's some, you know, great stuff happening. People are experimenting with transdermal vaccines so that, you know, basically you'd be able to mail somebody a patch and they could Put it on their arm so there's there's brighter days ahead but uh until then i'd say thank goodness for those people that are really doing great work for us i didn't know that that's fascinating and, and interesting and and definitely could could do a lot so um i want to ask one more question to the both of you and this has been fantastic i wish we had more time um but you know in, in addition we've talked mostly about the adults today um but just yesterday vaccination of eligibility expanded within pediatric populations so mm -hmm. yesterday the fda expanded the emergency authorization for Pfizer's vaccine to include 12 to 15 year old children. And so that means that the vaccines, the, the Pfizer's vaccine at least, is going to be available to anyone 16 and older. Um, we've gotten a, some questions already about, you know, how do you even just, just a, how do you even just deal with the 16 to 19 year old population? But, but I'm, I'll ask you generally, what should providers do to now to start planning for the, for more pediatric outreach? or outreach to, to, you know, for pediatric patients, I should say, and are there messaging strategies or communication channels that you think are going to be more ideal for this patient population? Annie, I'll start with you. I know social media could really be a player here. Well, I'll tell you, the answer is not to go out and do a bunch of TikTok videos. I don't <laughs> think that's the, that's, that's, that's not going to be the best use of your time. Um, but, uh, you know, I mentioned it all uh, earlier about that, um, uh, the adult uh, uh, caregiver, you know, that the the mom, I mean, as as much as uh, you know, we we want to appeal to the parents as as we can, um, you know, if the, if the parents are getting vaccinated, when you know, when the, when the parent even uh, schedules their appointment for the vaccination, that could be an opportunity to say, hey, uh, you know, would you like to make an appointment for your kids as well? You know, if you've got um, you know, more of vaccination clinic style where people show up and that's the only thing that you're doing there. Uh, that could be a great way to adjust your messaging and say, you know, bring bring your kids in, bring the whole family, come on down, we'll, we'll, we'll get you all vaccinated. Um, and, you know, treat it the way that you would treat any other kind of uh, expectation. You know, we know that kids are gonna go back to school for, um, kids are going to need a physical to go back to school. That's an annual thing. You know, every year we, we put out these campaigns around back to school physicals, come in and get that. This could be just part of that campaign, you know, come in to, for your uh, physical and your vaccination will be part of that. Um, don't make it an option. Don't treat it as this like separate other, this other thing. It should be treated as just this is just a normal way of of life now and your kids are going to be part of that uh that move to be vaccinated as well and it should be built into our our behavior um you know the the targeting again that persona that's going to be making that decision i think is the best way that we're going to get um all of the the, the young people vaccinated excellent meg i'm going to give you the last word what do you think how do we reach out to pediatric patients well, I'll say I'll focus on those 12 to 15 year olds that are newly eligible. And I'd say, you know, yeah, the messaging is, I believe, to the parents or to the to the responsible adults. And I think they'll make this decision as they make all their decisions for their kids. Right. Part part head and part heart. So let's educate around the science and and let's engage their hearts around future and, and where they want to be able to see their children's grow to in the future safely. Uh, and start families of their own, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, head and heart, always head and heart. 
What a great way to end it. Well, thank you, head and heart. So uh, folks, that takes us to the top of the hour. It's time to conclude uh, the webinar. Thank you again, Megan Annie. What a great conversation we've had today. Um, our audience, we value your time and feedback. Uh, take a moment to fill out our brief post-webinar survey. Uh, modern healthcare, reputation, well health, we all want to know what you thought of this webinar so that we can all provide the best content and resources for you. So make sure to take that. Um, we'd like to once again thank the sponsors of today's webinar, Well Health and Reputation. Uh, for more information about both of these organizations, you can visit the websites on our screen. Uh, this webinar will, will be available on demand and a copy of the slides and a link to the recording uh, will be available to webinar attendees within the next 48 hours. This concludes today's presentation. Have a great day. Thanks, Annie and Meg. Thank you.